Taking off in a spaceship is one of the most uniquely terrifying things I've ever experienced. You sit waiting, strapped into a seat, with your body flipped 90 degrees, facing the sky, like you're waiting for a roller coaster ride to start. As pre flight checks go on and on endlessly, you just sit there, uncomfortably waiting. Everything is done remotely, so there is nothing for you to do but listen. As the pre flight checks finish, systems begin to turn on beneath you one by one. Clicks and groans and a strange noise of things engaging fill your ears as your heart begins to pound with anticipation. It feels as if a giant creature is waking up beneath you. Then, the countdown begins. Ignition sequence has started. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Once you hear the word zero, it's hard to think of anything. Your adrenaline takes over as a rumbling roar begins to reverberate the entire ship and your body with it. You feel yourself being lifted into the air, and then a kick rattles you to your bones as the main engines engage. That's when things really start to get gnarly. The weight of the G-forces pressing down on your chest makes it difficult to breathe as you shake like a paint can getting mixed at the hardware store. Your body feels so heavy it sinks back into the chair, and you feel like you weigh a million billion pounds. The next sensation is like a punch being driven to your gut and all over your entire body, refusing to release, not letting up. You feel as if your bones will break from the pressure, as if your heart will be flattened and your brain will melt. Then, slowly, it begins to dissipate. It takes a few moments for you to realize, while you recover from what just happened, but it dawns on you suddenly. You feel different. You suddenly weigh nothing at all. The only thing preventing you from floating around the cabin is the straps holding you in place. The flight only lasts for a few minutes, so you can't take those off. But you can imagine what it would feel like if you did, especially after all those times riding the vomit comet. I looked over at the billionaire's face to see him smiling wide. I don't want to say his name here. I'm afraid of the consequences if I do, even more so after what happened. So I'll just call him Jay. Looking out the window, I could see the earth far down below us, speeding past at high speeds. The sensation was surreal, and I couldn't help but join Jay in grinning white as we watched the beautiful world pass by down below. The other passengers were equally as enchanted by the sight and all of us sat silently, just taking it in. The blue planet passed by silently beneath us, blanketed in white clouds which looked new and different from this angle. It felt like sacrilege to speak at that moment, as if we were in church during a prayer. But then, something happened. A loud pop. The sound surprised us all, and the ship began to shake with a slight tremor as if it had been knocked slightly of course. I heard sirens and alarms begin to blare. Lights were flashing and ground control called up to us asking if we were okay. I didn't know how to reply. I looked around to see the other passengers who were still recovering, glancing around the cabin with terrified wide eyes. Every possible scenario of awful things that could happen ran through my mind and I had no idea what to say to the people back at base. Were we okay? How was it possible for us to know? What if our oxygen levels were slowly dropping, or the pressure of the cabin was slowly increasing? Wasn't that what they were supposed to tell us? We're fine, said Jay robotically, looking far more calm than the rest of us. I looked at his chest and saw a spot of blood there, about the size of a dime. Turn off the alarms please, ground control. The alarms died off, one by one, but some were still blaring loudly and a few lights were flashing. All of them. His voice was different from normal. The grin on his face was gone as well, replaced by a calm, flat effect that made him look completely stoic. You're bleeding. I said to him, unsure how that could have happened. Are you sure you're okay? He looked down at himself and touched the blood through his gloved hand, holding up his finger to inspect it. 
for letting me know. I'll be fine. Crown control was in my ear, speaking rapidly. Say again, who's bleeding? Is someone injured up there? Nothing to worry about. Said Jay. It's from a couple days ago. A small kitchen accident. The G forces must have reopened the wound. Is everything stabilized? Life support systems are normal, yes. Uh, the ship may have been punctured by micrometeoroids or orbital debris. The hull is designed to withstand an event like this, so you should be alright for the rest of the trip. If you want to continue. Said the hit flight technician at ground control, sounding nervous but clearly wanting to appease his boss. Everyone knew how much he had been looking forward to this. A piece of space debris wasn't going to stop Jay. We're good if you are. He said, not asking us what we thought of that idea. The engineers back at home base responded in the affirmative, and we continued our flight, landing a few minutes later. Nobody dared to question the boss when he said to continue the journey as planned. The rest of the flight was uneventful, Jay saying almost nothing and simply sitting there with his hands folded in his lap. He wasn't looking out the window anymore, strangely enough, as if he was suddenly tired of the view. The landing went as expected. We descended back to the ground smoothly in the landing pod and exited the craft to be greeted by company personnel. Best day ever! Jay exclaimed upon exiting the craft, a fake smile now plastered on his face that hadn't been there a minute before. I had the strangest feeling that it wasn't really Jay anymore. Not really. But I didn't understand why I felt that way, or how that would be possible. Very soon though, I would find out. A few days later, I got a phone call from his office, asking me to join him there for a meeting. He wanted to talk about our trip to space. His secretary told me he wanted to reminisce. I reluctantly agreed. As I entered the headquarters where Jay's office was located, I couldn't help but notice an unsettling thing while waiting in the lobby. Everyone had the same vacant look on their faces that Jay had after the impact on the spacecraft. They all walked around quietly, moving robotically with their arms stiffly at their sides. Normally, I would have been recognized by at least a few people in the place. They would have been smiling, greeting me with a plum after our successful flight into space. But instead of the hero's welcome I had expected, Nobody was even remotely happy to see me. They walked past me without a word or a glance. I told myself they were just busy, trying to calm myself down. My heart was beating fast, and I was tapping my foot with nervous energy as I sat in the waiting area. The flight was yesterday's news. I said to myself, people had other things on their minds at this busy company. But I didn't feel any better. When the receptionist called me up to the desk a few minutes later, she greeted me in a monotone. Her face was expressionless. Hello, Mr. Davis, she said. Jay is expecting you upstairs. Please proceed to elevator B. Her eyes opened and closed. But then a second set of eyes blinked beneath that, perpendicular to the ones on the outside, revealing another set of irises beneath. These ones jet black as coal. I froze for a second, sputtering, unsure how to react. My heart felt like it had stopped in my chest, only to resume beating three times as fast. The room was spinning slightly as I looked at the hostile eyes of those around me. I saw everyone in the lobby had stopped what they were doing. They were frozen, watching me, waiting to see what I would do. My leg took a step forward without conscious effort on my part, heading up towards the office. Play it cool, my instinct said. Don't let them know that you know. I smiled at the receptionist and thanked her, walking towards the elevator. The regular hustle and bustle of the main lobby resumed and people began to continue with their lives as if nothing had happened. Never in my life had I felt as scared as I did while riding up that elevator. Jay's office was at the top floor of the building. There was no getting away. What had I been thinking coming to this place? Only one thing could possibly help me, I realized, but I would have to be quick and very sneaky. 
the private elevator doors open, and I was immediately inside Jay's office. He was standing at the window, looking out over the city. His back was turned to me. Do you know what I love about this place? He asked without looking my way. I hesitated, but answered carefully. No. What's that, Jay? The creatures who run it. You people. You're also... Trusting. He turned around, and I saw his eyes were black as opals. He blinked that same strange set of perpendicular eyelids, and they returned to normal for an instant, then reverted back again to that awful coal black anticolor. Have you ever seen a video of a giant squid deep beneath the surface of the ocean? He asked. I nodded. I had recently seen one such video. It had terrified me badly. The idea that creatures so horrifying could live in such close proximity to us seemed impossible. Like sharing an apartment with a demon, or sharing an office with an alien. They have captured these creatures on film. Your experts, by mimicking a photoluminescent creature deep beneath the surface. In the pitch black space down there, they can tantalize one, lure it out from the darkness. What do you mean, you're experts? Who are you? What have you done to him? Where's Jay? He ignored my question. I heard the elevator door shut behind me as he began to strike towards me purposefully. Do you know what they look like, these giant squids, before they spread their tentacles outward and expand into the beautiful, deadly creatures that they are? I couldn't speak could only stumble backwards, hitting the cold metal of the elevator door behind me. They looked like bullets, shot from a gun, flying through the ocean at impossible speeds. They compress themselves down and fly through the water like projectiles. Just like we do. You want to know what we are? We are the alpha predators of deep space. Great white sharks made of dark matter waiting for something to come by, drawn in occasionally by the light, before retreating into the blackness again. My plan had completely flat my mind for an instant, but then I remembered the phone in my hand, recording everything from up my sleeve. My camera was just poking up at the top, taking a recording of what I was seeing. You humans think you're so clever, he said, whipping a tentacle towards me which came from nowhere. It snatched up my phone easily and he took it in his hand, then deleted the video I'd been secretly recording a second later. Who do you really think will believe you? It doesn't matter what you do. We're here now. You saw them all downstairs. We're taking over now. This planet will be ours soon. There's nothing you can do but submit, like they did. I was pressing the elevator's down button behind me as he spoke. Tentacles now ripping holes in the suit and popping out and revealing themselves like Dr. Octopus. The thrashing limbs were dark purple, over 20 feet long, and covered in suckers which looked to contain sharp teeth within them. Take my word for it. Joining them is the best thing I ever did. All you have to do is let me help you. Like they helped me. It sounded like Jay's voice talking now. Only it was sly and manipulative sounding. Still. It was the closest thing to him I had seen or heard since the day of the impact on the space shuttle. Jay, listen to me. You have to snap out of it. You have to fight that thing. This isn't you. His eyes blinked sideways again, revealing that awful blackness once more. It was like looking at a nightmare. Oh, but it is. This is me now. And soon you will be one of us. Submit. Surrender. Give in. Become one of the brood. A tentacle snapped outwards suddenly in my direction, whipping my hand painfully just as the elevator door opened. I stumbled backwards into it, hitting the button for the ground floor. Jay didn't try to stop me. He just watched me go, smiling. The tentacles retreated back into his sights, and he waved to me playfully 
as the elevator door closed. The employees downstairs didn't try to stop me when I left the building. Everyone watched, silently, standing still and staring like a pack of wild dogs whose territory had been entered, daring me to try something. By the time I got home, I knew I didn't have much time left. The place on my hand where the tentacle got me, it has three pronged hole punched into it now. Like a radioactive symbol. That's what I am, I guess. Radioactive. I'll hide out here, in my house, for as long as I can. There's not much else I can do, aside from telling my story and waiting for the transformation. Maybe if I post it here, he won't find a way to take it down. He certainly got rid of it everywhere else I've tried to share this. I can feel the seeds he planted in my hand. Like leeches, or slugs, the things beneath my flesh are crawling, moving up my wrist, burrowing a path towards my heart by the looks of it. They're moving slowly but steadily in that direction, like a Bugs Bunny cartoon in slow motion. They're burrowing along my forearm as I type this. I get the feeling, once they reach my heart or my brain, wherever they're headed, that will be the end of my conscious thoughts. I won't be me anymore. I'll be them. Whatever they are. There isn't much I can do, except try to warn you. They're already here. And they're coming for you all. They have a powerful leader with unlimited resources at his disposal. Be careful of the people with the opal eyes. We don't have much time left. Don't say. I didn't warn you. <laughs>